E estamos ao vivo. Eduardo, can you hear me? We are online. Ok, pessoal, muito bom dia, então, a todos e todas. Hoje, então, nós vamos ter o palestrante Ashley Montanaro, da Universidade de Bristol. Eu agora vou mudar para inglês, já que o nosso palestrante é estrangeiro, tá ok? Então, ao final, vocês poderão fazer as perguntas e eu vou apresentar agora o professor Ashley. Um minuto. Bom... Well, Hi Ashley, I am Professor Eduardo Inasuzioni, and today I will introduce you. First of all, thank you, Professor Ashley, for accepting the, the invitation to give a talk in the fourth quantum computing workshop. Well, it's a great pleasure listening to you, and we are very proud of having you in our workshop. Now, let me introduce Ashley. Uh, has worked in the field of quantum computing for 17 years specializing in quantum algorithms and quantum computational complexity and has published over 50 papers on this topic. He holds a PhD in quantum computing from the University of Bristol, supervised by Professor Richard Joseph, has been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cambridge and is now professor of quantum computation at Bristol. He holds an ERC consolidator grant and was awarded a uh, Whitehead Prize in 2017 by London Mathematical Society. He served uh, on the steering committee of the International Conference on Quantum Information Processing from 2016 to 2019 and was a founding editor of the journal Quantum. He is co-founder of Facecraft, a quantum software startup whose goal is to get the most out of near-term quantum computers. Uh, today, Professor Montanaro will present the talk entitled Quantum Algorithms for Solve Differential Equations. Thank you again and have a nice talk, Ashley. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and th thank you for that very kind introduction and also uh, to the organizers for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I apologize that my talk will have to be in, in English. Um, so, if uh, so because all I can see on my screen is my own slides. If anything goes wrong, then please do uh, let me know. Um, and similarly, if, if there are any questions that come up during the talk from, from my side, I will be happy to take them. Um, so I'm indeed going to be talking about quantum algorithms for differential equations today. So the talk I'm giving is going to be based on two papers. One of them is with Noah Linden and Changpeng Xiao, and this is a paper about quantum algorithms for the heat equation. And the other is a paper with uh, Dongan, Noah Linden, Jinpeng Yu, Changpeng Xiao, and Jiasu Wang. And this is a paper on quantum algorithms for solving stochastic differential equations, uh, especially in mathematical finance. So both of these references are on screen, and everything that I say is going to be in those two papers. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so 
One thing that many people, such as myself, are very interested in doing is trying to find exciting applications for quantum computers. And one particular area where quantum computers could be useful is solving differential equations. Um, so, for example, we might try to solve uh, linear partial differential equations, um, and I've got an example of one uh, here on the screen. So, in fact, this is going to be the, the heat equation that we're going to encounter later as well. Um, and one reason why it might be plausible that we can solve differential equations using a quantum computer is that they're often solved classically by discretizing the, the, the PDE. And what this gives us is a system of linear equations rather than a system of, of one or more differential equations. So we get a system of discrete linear equations. And we know that quantum computers can have, in some sense, an exponential advantage over classical computers for solving linear equations. And I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a second. But at least in, in some settings, uh, we can get a very significant speed up for solving linear equations with a quantum computer. So that might give us an indication that we might be able to see an advantage for solving differential equations too. And there are some indications this might be the case. Um, so there have been quite a huge number of works on this topic, and I've only put a few of them on this slide. Um, and I should say, by the way, that whenever I have numbers in these citations on my slides, this is an archive reference. So if you just go to archive.org and enter that number, you'll get the, the right paper. And the, all these papers and many more have looked at quantum algorithms for, for solving PDEs. But um, there still remains a question, I, I would say, now of, if we specify a problem um, very sort of precisely and in, the, and in the sense that we have a particular problem that we want to solve and we want to um, measure the speed of the quantum algorithm versus the speed of the classical algorithm and take into account all of the different factors that go into the complexity, once we take all these considerations into account, is it the case that the quantum computer still outperforms the classical one? Um, and this is something which, to my knowledge, is still open for differential equations. And this is something that we were trying to address in these papers. Can we really see a quantum speed up for a problem where we specify what the input is, specify what the output is, and we um, take uh, and we, we measure all of the complexity uh, considerations going into computing the output? OK, so I just want to talk for a second about this connection to linear equations. So. Um, as I mentioned, differential equations, often you can reduce solving them to solving linear equations. And I just want to mention what the quantum approach is to solving linear equations and, and why it's exciting. Um, so the quantum algorithm, at least one of the quantum algorithms for solving linear equations, it looks at solving sparse systems of linear equations. So these are linear equations corresponding to sparse matrices. So a matrix we might say is D sparse if it has at most d non-zero elements in each row and column. So we imagine in the sparse linear equations problem that we're given access to some matrix A that has at most d non-zero entries in each row and each column, and we're given some vector B, and we want to output x such that A times x is equal to B. So classically, um, there are different ways we can do this. I mean, a natural way is just you know, calculate the inverse of A and multiply B by that but there are other sort of iterative methods we can use as well. But one thing we know classically is that if we want to uh, write down the full solution to this problem, it's going to take us time at least n, because we have this vector x, which is of length n, and so even to write it down is going to take us time at, at least n. And interestingly, we can overcome this barrier in a quantum setting, and we can think of a sort of quantum variant of this problem, where we imagine that we have the ability to produce a quantum state corresponding to the vector b, so a quantum superposition over basis states where the amplitudes in the superposition are these coefficients bi. And we also have access to the matrix A as before, um, and we want to produce the state x, which corresponds to a superposition of amplitudes xi, where xi is, is the ith entry of x. Now, these things might not be normalized quantum states the way that I've written it, but maybe we can divide by the overall like, norm of the, the vector to produce something that is a normalized state. So this sort of quantum version of solving linear equations is to go from the state B to the state X. And it turns out that sometimes we can get an exponential advantage over classical linear equation solving for 
this uh, task. So if the matrix A uh, has condition number kappa, so basically this is just a measure of whether the matrix is, uh, is far away from being non-invertible in some sense. If the matrix has condition number kappa, then the state X can be approximately produced in time that's polynomial in the log of N in the sparsity D and then the uh, condition number kappa. So this is exciting because if D and kappa are small, then this is only polynomial in, in log of N. And this is an exponential improvement on just writing down the vector classically. So, so this hints that quantum algorithms might be able to get a, an exponential speed up for solving problems based around linear equations. Um, but already we can probably see some sort of challenges associated with this quantum algorithm. For example, you know, in this case, we don't have a sort of string of information that's written down in front of us. We have a quantum state as input. And first question is, how do we produce that initial quantum state? Um, how do we get some information out of the final quantum state X that's produced in the end? Because we know that with a quantum state, we can't just read out all of the information in that state uh, for free. We need to do measurements on the states and we need to produce multiple copies to get information from those copies. And uh, this is not, not straightforward. Um, the other question is, how do we even access this matrix A? We need to somehow implement this on a quantum computer. We need to be able to access the entries of the matrix A. Uh, this condition number kappa, this comes into the complexity of the algorithm and we're going to need to perhaps work out what it is or at least find some bounds on it. Um, and also we need to understand what the level of accuracy is we produce in, at the end of the quantum algorithm. We need to work out what the level of error is in the uh, answer that we get from the algorithm. Um, and if we try to take all of these considerations into account um, and we also make a few assumptions about the problem that we want to solve, um, in joint work with Sam Pallister from a few years ago, we showed that if we try to use this linear equation solving algorithm known as HHL, this quantum algorithm I mentioned on the previous slide, if we try to use this algorithm to solve PDEs, partial differential equations, discretized using the finite element method, which is a very sort of prominent way of discretizing uh, PDEs to try and solve them classically. Um, if we use this method combined with quantum linear equation solving, uh, it turns out that we can't get an exponential speed up if the number of variables, or as we were thinking of it, the spatial dimension of the problem, if the number of variables is, is D, D, and D is uh, fixed perhaps, um, or uh, at least it, it doesn't sort of scale with the input size, then if we try using this quantum approach, we can't get an exponential speed up. The speed up is at most polynomial, uh, because once you take all these considerations into account, it turns out the exponential speed up kind of disappears. Um, so that means that if we want to understand whether we can use quantum algorithms to solve a certain PDE more efficiently, we need to look at it in more detail and we need to think carefully about you know, can we actually use quantum approaches to get a speed up? And this is what we've tried to do in the work I'm going to present today. So there are two uh, topics I would like to present. Firstly, is looking at applying quantum algorithms to solving a particular and very simple PDE called the heat equation. Um, so this is a equation which models the transport of heat in some medium. And we were looking at a version of the heat equation in D dimensions where we have a rectangular region, or I guess a hyper rectangular region in, the, in, that, um, um, in, in those D dimensions. And we've got periodic boundary conditions. And we're wanting to solve the PDE that we have on screen here. So this is saying that the fluctuations of the, the temperature U with, with T uh, are proportional to the, second the sum of the second derivatives of uh, U with respect to each spatial direction. Um, and this, this is the equation that governs the transport of heat. And what we were particularly interested in is fixing a particular problem that we want to know the answer to and, solve, and that solving the heat equation somehow corresponds to. And the problem we were considering is basically trying to work out the amount of heat in a given region at a certain time. So we imagine that we've got some initial condition U0, uh, which is the initial distribution of heat. We have a final time t and a subset of the overall region. 
and we want to compute the total amount of heat within that region at time t up to some level of accuracy epsilon, some, some overall error epsilon. And we were interested in whether quantum algorithms would outperform classical ones for solving this problem, because there are many classical techniques for solving this kind of problem, and also many quantum techniques, as we'll see. And we wanted to work out, like, will we see a quantum advantage? Okay, and the second result I want to mention is about speeding up the solution of stochastic differential equations. So these are different to the PDE that I put on the previous slide because they're ones where there's some notion of randomness um, in the equation itself. And in particular, we're thinking of equations which are somehow modeled by the situation in mathematical finance, where we have some price, let's say, of some asset XT, and this changes over time. And the way it changes is that there's some sort of drift term, which is sort of measured here with like this mu, which might be just modeling the fact that uh, prices normally go up, or maybe modeling the fact that you can get some sort of interest um, on your uh, so, so on your investment, so you sort of automatically get some some money coming in on your investment. So there's this this drift term, and then there's also this sort of variance term here, which is showing that um, there's some sort of random fluctuations in the price of your your asset. So uh, this so this first part is. Um, so somehow not just just sort of moving sort of in one direction, and this second part is a random fluctuation. And what we're what we're interested in is understanding what the payoff is at a certain time. So we might imagine that we have um, some assets that's you know its price is evolving, and then at a certain time we want to know like do we do we get some what, what's the amount of money that we get at that at that stage based on the price of the asset and we can think of you know somewhat complicated payoff functions or maybe simple ones too but what we were interested in in computing is the expectation of the of the payoff at time t given that the initial uh, price was distributed according to some distribution um, and we want to estimate this whole thing up to accuracy epsilon so we so you know the, the general setting we're thinking about is uh, which is actually not dissimilar to the setting for the heat equation is that we're imagining something moving around um, over time and we want to compute its expectation or its expected payoff at a certain time. Okay, and now I'd like to summarize the results that we get for the heat equation, the first part. Um, now this slide has an outrageous number of uh, numbers on it, an outrageous number of different complexities on it. So, and I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but I just wanted to have a summary altogether of the different complexities that we obtain. And basically what we did is we looked at a number of different classical and quantum methods for solving the heat equation in the sense that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Um, and the ones, uh, they're, they're all given in this table here. And on the left hand side, we have the different methods. We have four classical ones and four quantum ones. And then the columns here are the spatial dimension that we're looking at. And we see that the complexity in general does depend on the, um, on the dimension. And the complexity turns out to primarily depend only on the accuracy epsilon that you want, and also on the dimension if the dimension is increasing. So, there are some other terms um, as well, like, like L, depending on L and depending on T, but these are somehow lower order. Um, and, uh, and I've not included them in the table. Um, also in the table, I'm using this big O no a tilde notation. And the idea is behind this is that it hides logarithmic factors in the complexities. So for example, some of these complexities are epsilon to the minus two times log one over epsilon or something like that. And we're hiding these complexities in this table. So we're just seeing the dependence on the, the accuracy epsilon. Okay, and what I've done is I've highlighted the best performing method in blue for each dimension, each spatial dimension. So what we see is that for dimensions one to three, actually the best performing method is a classical method, the classical fast Fourier transform. And I'll say a bit about what that is in a, in a minute. Um, Whereas for dimension bigger than three, we have a quantum method, which turns out to perform the best. Um, but we also see that 
in no case does the quantum algorithm achieve an exponential improvement on the classical algorithm. Um, so, of course, this isn't to say there might not be some other quantum algorithm that does achieve a, an exponential improvement, like we didn't prove this, but what we were doing was comparing all of the algorithms that we could find, all the ones we could think of, and working out what their complexities were and seeing if there was an improvement. And what we saw was that there was only at most a polynomial improvement uh, in any case. Though another point I should mention is about space usage. So the methods that I've starred here, which are just three of the classical ones, they use an amount of space that's polynomial in one over epsilon. Whereas the other methods without a star, they're using an amount of space that's polylogarithmic in one over epsilon. So the space usage is, is exponentially better. So this is a way in which some of the quantum algorithms are uh, more efficient than some of the classical algorithms. They don't necessarily get a time improvement, but they do get a space improvement, which is kind of interesting. OK, so this is the sort of overall summary of the heat equation results. Now, what I'd like to do is go through the um, some of these different results and describe sort of how they work. I will definitely not be doing this in detail because there isn't enough time, but I will at least sort of try to summarize what some of these rows in the table are. Um, I should also say as well that this row here that I've called HHL, this is the quantum linear equation solving method that I, I mentioned a few slides ago, the HHL algorithm, Harrow, Hasidim and Lloyd. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so all of the methods that we compared, all of the classical ones and the quantum ones, they are based on discretizing the set of uh, dif the differential equation that we have for the heat equation. And they're based on discretizing both time and space. And we can do this uh, via many methods. The method that we used is the finite, is finite difference method and so-called for, um, forward time central space method. Um, and this uh, method basically says, okay, we can approximate the derivative du by dx by u of x plus h minus u of x divided by h plus some correction term of order h. Um, and we can do the same for the uh, second derivative as well, um, or indeed higher derivatives if we want to. Um, and if we make this approximation in the differential equation for, for the heat equation, then we get a set of linear constraints rather than a set rather than one uh, continuous sort of constraint. So we have a set of discrete linear constraints that say, okay, the approximate the heat approximately at position x and position time plus delta t minus the heat at uh, position x and time t uh, all over delta t. So this is like du by dt on the left hand side. Um, this is equal to some proportionality constant alpha times by the approximation of the sum of the second derivatives of the uh, heat with respect to the uh, position x. And this gives us the thing on the right hand side that, that we see here. So this, um, this is the condition on the heat at time, you know, t plus delta t. And then we repeat this condition for all of this different steps, delta t, for all the way from time zero through to time t. And then this gives us um, an overall set of constraints telling us what the heat must do at each time. So we get a system of, of linear equations. Um, and it turns out that if um, this is a sort of standard result, that if we want to get final accuracy epsilon, then we can take the time step delta t to be order epsilon and the space step delta x to be square root of epsilon. So uh, we can do that. And then this tells us how many equations we have and how many, um, uh, yeah, how, how many sort of variables are associated with each equation. And indeed, if we do this, we get that we have um, order epsilon to the minus d over two, uh, minus one linear equations to solve. Uh, and that just comes uh, from this um, constraint about the, uh, the step in the x direction and also the uh, step in the time dimension. Okay, and to, uh, to uh, work out how hard it is to solve this system of linear equations, we need to work out its condition number. And this condition number uh, scales, it turns out, like epsilon to the minus one. That's something that you can prove um, about the system of linear equations. Um, so this gives us that the 
over, and, and then this allows us to work out what the overall classical complexity is. Um, and it turns out that something you can do there to work out the class, uh, to classical complexity of a particular algorithm called the conjugate gradient descent algorithm, um, something you can do there is to uh, compute the square root of the condition number and multiply it by the number of equations. And if we do that, then we get um, this bound here on the right hand side. So we can see that the classical complexity uh, scales with, uh, with the dimension, scales exponentially with the dimension. Um, and right, so, and it sort of seems like the quantum complexity um, or at least the dominant part of the quantum complexity should just scale like the condition number kappa. Um, so if we were to go back a few slides, which I guess I won't do now, if we were to go back a few slides to the complexity of this uh, quantum algorithm, the HHL algorithm for solving a set of linear equations, we see that it sort of scales um, nicely with the condition number. It's only in fact linear in the condition number up to some, some log terms. But so this seems like it should give us only one over epsilon for the quantum complexity, which would be an exponential speed up. But it turns out, I mean, this, this is the complexity if you just want to produce a quantum state, which is equal to the solution of the heat equation, like the, the overall solution to the heat equation um, divided by its norm. So like a normalized version of this solution. Um, and what we actually want to do is we want to approximate the heat in some given region, which means, among other things, we need to know what the norm of that final state it, U tilde is, the approximate solution to the heat equation produced by the quantum computer. And if we want to get high enough um, accuracy for doing that, then it turns out this gives us a complexity of epsilon to the minus d over two, d over four, sorry, minus two. So going from um, this sort of producing the state to actually using it for computing something turns out to give us a big penalty in terms of the complexity of the algorithm. Um, okay, so that's one approach, like we just write down the linear equations and try and solve them uh, classically and, and quantumly. Um, and then we can also look at um, other methods of doing it. One of them is to take the equation that I wrote down uh, just there, to take the, the set of linear constraints that I wrote down there, and um, rewrite it as uh, in this form here. So this is just collecting some of the terms together. And then what we can do, uh, rather than solving the set of linear equations, is basically step forward in time by doing this sort of matrix multiplication to give us the, the new version. So basically now on the left hand side, we've just got the temperature at time t plus delta t. And on the right hand side, we've got uh, something about that depends on the temperature at time t. So if we um, multiply, the, if, if we just do this matrix multiplication to produce us the new uh, version of u tilde, then this takes us time epsilon to the, the minus d over two to do the matrix multiplication. And that, that comes from the uh, fact that this is the size of the, um, the, size of the, uh, the linear system uh, times by epsilon to the, the minus one, which is the, um, which is the number of steps that we need to, to make. Okay, and we can take this, um, so, so that's one thing we can do. We can step forward and uh, and do this matrix multiplication. We can do even better than that because we can just diagonalize this discretized linear system using the fast Fourier transform because we can look at this, um, this matrix here, basically, on the right-hand side, and we can see that it has a special form, which is very symmetric, and we can take advantage of that to diagonalize it in time, you know, n log n, where n is the number of rows in the matrix. Uh, and this gives us a complexity that's like epsilon to the minus d over two. So this basically lets us solve the, the equa heat equation we just uh, that time. Um, and in fact, we can do even better than this, uh, which is that we can observe that this system of linear equations we've got here, actually this corresponds to a random walk. 
So what we're doing here at each step is with some probability, we're sort of staying where we are. And with some other probability, we're moving left or right. That's um, or in each dimension. And that's what this uh, set of equations is basically representing. And if we make this identification, we can uh, run this random walk and sample from the final distribution that we get at the end of the algorithm in time epsilon to the minus one, because that's the number of time steps that it takes uh, for the random walk. So um, then it turns out that uh, we get a bit more of a uh, penalty in terms of the time to this, this quantum algorithm, because, sorry, to this classical algorithm, because this has given us a sample, one sample from the final distribution. And what we actually want is to approximate the amount of heat in some region. So to do this accurately, we need to run a number of times, just determine whether we end up in this region S and take the average of the number of times we end up in the region S. And to get the, a good enough level of accuracy, uh, I'll say a bit more about this uh, in a minute, we need to run epsilon to the minus two times. So we have an overall complexity of epsilon to the minus three. Yeah. Okay, right, so those are different class, uh, classical methods, but we can also find quantum methods which are somehow analogous to these classical ones. Firstly, we can start with some initial state. We, we, we can sort of try to do something analogous to this classical idea of producing the distribution at time t um, corresponding to an initial distribution at time zero. And we can do this quantumly by starting out with a quantum state um, u zero corresponding to that initial distribution and trying to produce a quantum state corresponding to the final distribution. Um, one method we can use for doing this um, is a nice approach for accelerating random walks, which gives us a square root improvement in the time that it takes to uh, produce the, the final state. And this turns out to give us a complexity that's like epsilon to the minus d over 4 minus 1.5. Um, we could also do something a little bit like the fast Fourier transform method. And this um, is using the fact that there's a lot of symmetry in the system. We can diagonalize it. So we can basically implement the, um, the corresponding sort of time evolution uh, more efficiently by a, a sort of more straightforward quantum circuit that then has some sort of idea to do a post-selection for determining if we're in the, the right place at the end. Um, and this gives us time that's uh, slightly better, which is epsilon to the minus d over four minus one. Um, and finally, we can do something which doesn't involve linear equation solving at all, which is starting out with the classical random walk and speeding up our use of it using amplitude estimation. So this is a sort of very famous quantum algorithm, which enables us to get a square root improvement on the complexity of estimating the probability that uh, some co um, some con condition is true. So, for example, you know, the condition might be we do a, a random walk for some number of steps and do we end up in some region? And we can speed up this, this last classical approach um, based on random walks using this method. And classically, remember, we had epsilon to the minus one times epsilon to the minus two. Uh, using this amplitude estimation method, we get a square root improvement to that second epsilon term. So we get epsilon to the minus two in the end. OK, so for large D, this is an improvement on the classical method. OK, so basically, th this is what I wanted to say about the heat equation. So uh, I covered a, a lot of different techniques, only very briefly. But I guess the, the key point I wanted to get across is that although there are many quantum techniques uh, and many classical techniques, uh, we did not see a very significant quantum advantage for this approach. Um, and we did, uh, and, and where we did, it was only for large spatial dimensions. Okay, right. So I want to switch to the second set of results, which are about solving a stochastic, a stochastic differential equations. Uh, here, as if you recall, the idea is that we've got some initial distribution on uh, on values, and we have some. The idea is we have some sort of fluctuating variable that starts out with this initial distribution. It sort of moves around, and we want to work out the payoff at the final time of um, based on the based on the evolution of this um, this value. Okay, so. This this actually you know is a generalization of the thing that I mentioned towards the end of 
solving the heat equation by doing this uh, random walk and then ending up in a uh, determining whether we end up in a particular region. And what we're going to be thinking about is a general quantum approach for solving these kind of problems. And before we do that, um, I'll just mention the sort of general classical method for solving these. And this is via the Monte Carlo method, of which the method for the heat equation I mentioned is a simple example. And a way that uh, we can solve these problems is that, again, we discretize time in the same way that we did uh, for the heat equation. Um, and we have our asset that's moving around and we step its price forward in time using a random walk. So sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, and we simulate this process. Um, one simple way of doing this, which is called Milstein discretization, uh, takes the step size being order epsilon, if we want to achieve final accuracy epsilon. And this means that our final cost for taking one sample of the asset's price at a final time is uh, one over epsilon, because we take, if t is, is uh, order one, if, if t is a sort of constant in this. And this enables us to um, get a uh, yeah, cost of one over epsilon per sample. And if we have a random variable with variance sigma squared, we can estimate, estimate its mean um, up to accuracy epsilon using sigma squared over epsilon squared samples. This is Chebyshev's inequality. Um, so if we follow this approach, we need, and, and if we assume that the uh, variance is, is order one, is, is constant, then we take uh, we have an overall runtime of one over epsilon cubed, and this is similar, unsurprisingly, perhaps to to what we had on the previous slide for the heat equation. So we're just multiplying one over epsilon by one over epsilon squared here. And classically, people have thought about methods for improving this, and one nice technique that's known is called multi-level Monte Carlo, which is developed by Giles in a series of papers, and. The idea behind this method is, is very nice. It's that we imagine that we've got some sequence of random variables, P0 through PL, and these are approximating some uh, random variable that we really are interested in, P, with increasing accuracy, but also increasing cost. So we think of P as being the payoff um, of the, the asset in the sort of genuine, like continuous case that we really care about. And these P0 through PL are discretizations with increasing levels of fineness. So P0 might be a very fine grained discretizer, sorry, a very coarse grained discretization. So one that has very few points and PL would be a much finer discretization that has many points in it. And um, we have access to this, uh, this sort of notion of discretization in these methods for, for solving differential equations. And this allows us to write the overall expectation that we care about, the, the one at the sort of most fine-grained level, PL, the very fine-grained expectation of PL, as a sum of the expectations of PI, um, where it's subtracting off the PI minus one. So this is just some kind of telescoping sum. Um, and using linearity of expectation, we can uh, say that this is equal to expectation of PI minus expectation of PI minus one. Then we just rearrange the sum and we see that this whole thing just evaluates the expectation of PL um, if we assume that P minus one is, is equal to zero, which we can take it to be. So this lets us approximate the overall uh, mean that we're interested in, expectation of PL, as this um, sum and we compute the expectation of, of each of these differences up to some level of accuracy, sum them up, and then we get an accurate um, hopefully accurate uh, combined answer for the overall expectation. And the reason why this is helpful is that um, these things here, PI minus PI minus one, might have much lower variance. So it might be much more efficient to compute them uh, classically. So for example, we can think about this Milstein discretization scheme I mentioned, and we might define PI to be the payoff if we discretize with step length uh, two to the minus i. So we imagine that our step lengths are just uh, going down exponentially as i increases. And then this means that at each step, at the i-th step, it costs us two to the i to produce a final sample. And uh, it turns out, this isn't obvious, it's something you have to prove, that 
the variance of this random variable pi minus pi minus one is also is it gets smaller as i increases and it's two to the minus i so that means that the overall cost of computing this expectation at the ith level of pi minus pi minus one plus or minus epsilon over l is the variance divided by the accuracy squared uh, times by the cost of each sample at this level. And these two terms cancel, the two to the minus i and the two to the i, and we get just an overall cost of like L squared divided by epsilon squared. And uh, that means that because we have L of these levels, so I guess L plus one, then the overall cost is L cubed divided by epsilon squared. And we can take L to be logarithmic in one over epsilon, so we get an overall complexity that's like one over epsilon squared up to some log terms. So this is better than the one over epsilon cubed that we saw classically before. Okay, and we want to speed this up using a quantum algorithm. And it turns out that we can. Um, that, and ultimately we're going to use a subroutine, um, which is a general speed up for Monte Carlo methods. And it says that sort of informally, if we have the ability to generate samples from some random variable x that has variance sigma squared, then there's a quantum algorithm that approximates the mean of x plus or minus epsilon using a number of samples which scales linearly in sigma over epsilon. So it doesn't scale quadratically in sigma over epsilon like you saw before, up to some lower order terms which are hidden in these, this tilde, some logarithmic terms. So this gives us a square root type improvement on the analogous classical algorithm. And we're going to apply this Monte Carlo method speed up to this sequence of random variables pi minus pi minus one. So exactly the same way that we do uh, classically, we're going to estimate the mean of pi minus pi minus one for each, each i, but using this quantum method instead. Um, and what we see is that at the ith level, the cost is still two to the i for producing each sample. So we are not um, improving the, the cost of, of sampling. I mean, there might be other ways you can do this, but we're not improving that. Um, and we have the same variance bound that we had before, uh, classically, that the variance is two to the minus i. But then if we look at the complexity of the quantum algorithm, it now has a dependence that's the square root of the variance. So like two to the minus i over two, uh, divided by epsilon over l, as opposed to epsilon over l squared, times by two to the i. So we end up with something that's like two to the i over two, because these things don't quite cancel anymore, times by l divided by epsilon. And remember that like um, i is as big as l, it can be as big as l, which is as big as uh, log one over epsilon. So the net result is we have something that's like <coughs> square root of one over epsilon at the front here. L is like uh, log one over epsilon. So the overall cost is like one over epsilon to the 1.5. And that means that we've had got a, a modest improvement on the classical complexity because the classical complexity using this approach was, was one over epsilon squared. Um, so what we see from this is that quantumly we can improve this, um, this multi-level Monte Carlo method which gives us a uh, more efficient way of solving stochastic differential equations, and in particular, understanding the uh, final complex, uh, the, the final um, value, let's say, of assets at a certain time. And it turns out that this complexity can be improved a bit. So if this payoff function p that we want to compute is uh, continuous, is in a particular technical sense, then you can get this down to one over epsilon rather than one over epsilon to the 1.5. So in this case, we have a square root improvement on the classical complexity, because it turns out classically this, this remains about one over epsilon squared. So, so the, the quantum algorithm does give us an improvement on the classical algorithm still. Um, and it's worth saying actually that this, uh, this one over epsilon to 1.5 this also applies to the heat equation that I mentioned on the, the previous slide. So using this, this sort of newer idea, we can get the quantum complexity down a little bit further. Okay. Right. 
so this is basically everything I, I pretty much wanted to say today. So uh, finishing a little bit early, so hopefully that will get us a bit of time back. Um, so I just want to summarise to say a bit of intuition that we did gain from this work. So firstly, we gained the intuition that although quantum algorithms uh, do seem to achieve a speed up over classical ones for solving the heat equation, um, this speed up is likely to only be polynomial, so it's not exponential. Um, and on the other hand, the quantum algorithm might have some kind of advantage in terms of uh, flexibility or usage of space over the classical counterparts, because the classical algorithms that we considered as comparators, they are somehow very specific to the, uh, the heat equation, the fastest ones are at least. So the quantum algorithm is somehow more general. So we might expect that quantum methods might be useful for, for problems which have less structure to them or somehow are less specific. And also the quantum algorithms use less space than some of the classical algorithms, which could be interesting too. Um, the, we get, got some intuition that in the case of the heat equation, the best quantum algorithm for solving it was not based on linear equations, solving linear equations. And it might be the case that this holds more generally for other PDEs. And on the other hand, we've seen that in the general setting of stochastic differential equations, quantum algorithms can achieve uh, some kind of speed up over their classical counterparts, uh, which might be useful for some applications, uh, for including in mathematical finance. And somehow our goal throughout all of this work was to use these prototypical examples to tell us something about what we expect to see for more general differential equations. So it, I think a very interesting question for future work is to see whether these intuitions still hold for other differential equations and other applications that people might have. Okay, and that is in fact everything I wanted to say today. So um, thank you all very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Hello, okay. Thank you, Ashley. Very nice talk. Uh, we have uh, the YouTube chat, just one question. Felipe Almeida Barreto asks, intuitively, it seems to me that the larger D, the less work we must have since there are fewer numbers to crunch. Yet, we are looking for a small D in this algorithm. Can you comment about that? Um, so, so, so was the question that for large D, um, it should be easier because uh, we have few, fewer numbers? Was, uh, so, was, sorry, I... As, as, the, as the question I just did. That's, so so maybe, maybe I'll just say, oh, okay, oh, no, I see. I, okay, so I see the, I see the question. Are you, so, are you seeing in the comments? Yes, I can, I can see the question. So, um, right, so when D is larger, actually there are more numbers because um, we imagine that, uh, okay, so when we're discretizing this space that we're looking at, um, if we discretize it with accuracy epsilon in each dimension, then we would have one over epsilon to the D numbers in our space. We, we have a grid that's like one over epsilon by one over epsilon by one over epsilon. So this means that um, this is something called the curse of dimensionality, which classically is a big issue because it means that you can't even write down a solution for um, for large D. But in this case, yeah, so in this, we, we might hope that the quantum algorithm really achieves an advantage for larger D, but it turns out that in fact, the advantage cannot be very great, um, even for large D. Okay, Ashley, thank you. Thank you for, for answer. Uh, there, there is no more questions in the YouTube chat, but I, I'd like to ask you one or two questions. Sure. Uh, you, if, I, if I miss some, something, sorry, but when you solve the heat equation, you find at the end of your algorithm the integral of you, the answer of the uh, PDE, is that right? Yeah, in, in some region, yes. Ah, okay, you find a number. Because in general, like 
the HEGL algorithm, they find there uh, a vector, the quantum vector. Uh, otherwise, here you find just a number, the integral, right? Because this is, this is okay, this turns the problem uh, easier. I cannot say that, but because uh, when you have the vector, when you have a vector, you have to find uh, its components, right? And in the case here, you are obtaining the integral. What's right, the difference? Okay. Yeah. Right, that, that's, that's a really important point. Um, so indeed, when you use this HHL approach, you get some vector, but you get it as a quantum state. You don't get to write it down, right? So if you want to, um, to if, if you, so if you want to learn, okay, let me go back. So the point of view that we took in this work was really that we should have a problem which has classical input and classical output. So we want to be able to compare classical and quantum, and it's not fair to make the classical computer output a quantum state as its challenge because, you know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so we wanted something with classical input and classical output. And one thing, um, you know, that's somehow very natural is just computing the integral in some region because basically this is just the sum of some some of these numbers in your in your state at the end so the region could be very small in which case you're just looking at maybe one of the numbers so this would be one of the amplitudes basically in your final quantum state or maybe the region is big in which case you want to average over some uh, some of the amplitudes so this is somehow easier both for the classical algorithm and the quantum algorithm because you know they, they both no longer have to output the full vector but it turns out that um, outputting, you know, this this number rather than the states really increases the complexity of the quantum quantum algorithm because uh, you have to do some measurements on the final state to work out what this average is. Ah, okay, understand. Thank you. Uh, and just the last question: uh, Could you comment about how classical shadows could or not improve? The quantum quantum algorithm like uh, HEGL or this kind of algorithm. I mean, because it seems a useful method to obtain the final solution or average values of of vectors. I mean, observables. Right. That's that's a nice question. So I think, um, as I understand the idea of of classical shadows, it's that you make some measurements, um, you have a set of measurements which are designed to enable you to to extract the uh, the expectations of, of a bunch of, of terms with respect to the quantum state that you have without necessarily needing to, to measure all of those terms sort of in advance. So for example, maybe you want to output the expectations of all Pauli operators on like pairs of qubits or something like this. And it and it turns out sort of maybe surprisingly that you can do this with not so many measurements as, as you might fear. But as I understand it, and I'm not an expert on, on shadows, but as I understand it, you need to design your set of measurements that you, you take sort of with the knowledge of the overall set of, to, of measurements you're going to want to make uh, in advance, right? So, so it's not, so if I just do some, if I, if I look at the results of some, you know, some classical shadows for some quantum state, then they may not be helpful for enabling me to compute the measurements that I want for the heat equation, for example. They may not enable me to compute the, the integral within certain regions. On the other hand, you know, it may be that you can find a nice set of, um, of shadows that which would, would enable you to do that. So that could, and, and if that were the case, it could cut down some of the complexity that we see, um, we see here. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not actually clear to me this will help in the end because in the end, you fix in advance like what the this um, yeah what what the set is that you need to to know the information for. And I think yeah, even a computational basis measurement is probably enough. So so okay. So my, my final guess is that probably it won't help. Sorry, that was a very very long answer. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice, nice. Thank you. Okay, Ashley. Uh, there are more questions, however. We are a bit uh, delayed in our programming because we have some, some issues at the beginning of the day. Uh, so and now I, on the behalf of the, uh, of the organized committee, thank you for your presentation. It was a very nice presentation. And thank you. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Apologies for not getting to all the questions. Bye-bye.
Bye.